What's up, everybody? It's your friend Isaac. And before we get into this chat with Hollywood Mike Miranda, uh, he, he really dropped a really cool bomb at the end of this, at this uh, interview. He's going to give away something at the very end of this video. What we need you to do is take a moment before this even starts. Go over to the main video, not the live chat, but the main video, and leave a comment. You're going to want to leave a comment over there because at the end of this, Mike is going to pick a number and I'm going to count down from the top to the bottom of everybody's comments and whatever number he picks, they're going to win. So you're going to want to have your name associated with one of these comments. Now this is only happening on the day of the video. We had, we like for us, we're, we were kind of shocked he's going this route. We were excited about it. So we quickly made up a system of how we would do this. So leave a leave a legit comment not a live comment in the main feed for this specific interview with with uh, hollywood mike miranda he will call out a number on the live feed i will count down and that's who's going to win his prize so hopefully this explains it because we were kind of i don't know just want to make sure it's really clear to you guys how this is going to go down so he'll call out a number i will look on the main comments not the live feed, the main comments on this video, and that's who's going to win his prize. All right, take care. Enjoy this video as much as we did. See you soon. Are we there? He's almost there. He's almost there. there. Now he's connected. Can he? Oh, oh, no, he did not. Stop it. He's got the rad long sleeve on with the pink uh, hutch in the back. Look at the look at the back wall. Oh yeah. Well, I'm the Zoom captain, man. Dude, this is I'm not the first race, is it? <laughs> are we on? Are we live? We are. Uh, we're in the podcast, but we haven't really started yet. We're just we're just hanging out, dude. You want to hang out with us? Hell yeah, I want to hang out with you guys. <laughs> right on, dude. <laughs> So Craig, we still don't know who our guest is. You just saw you just saw his face, but we haven't introduced him. I know you're going to know exactly who it is, but Craig, tell me your first memory of this guest, and then we'll introduce him. Man, I'm gonna. I, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna rewind that that clock way back, bro. 1986. I'm 13 years old. This movie that I rented at Blockbuster came out called Rad. And so let me tell you about this movie. I think I wore, and I've said it before, I've worn a tape out, dude. I have worn that thing out forward and back, especially the beginning and ending credits, obviously first. But as I watched the, one of the best parts in there, uh, besides the prom scene, you got to love the race stuff, right? Hell track. If you watch the hell track scene forward and back and back and forward, the first thing you notice is this guy's like stands out in this pink, super bubblegum jersey and you know exactly who it is he's got the rad stash on board the guy's just pumping and pedaling and boom over the berm boom the step up to the platform it's mike miranda mike miranda and he i'm like damn what mike's crashing a lot in this video right that's my first memory i mean not to mention mike took podium Yep. In, the, in, in, the, in the movie, right? <laughs> Mike took podium. There's crew, Bart, and then you got Mike. We, we, oh, will get, we will get to this part. So everybody, welcome to Big Bike BMX. I am, I'm your uh, host tonight with my co-host and ride or die, Craig. Um, Yo, what's up, everyone? And, and you guys, I'm so psyched about um, getting, this, getting, getting this entire thing going. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am to get this guest. This, the way this started was uh, I took a phone call about a week ago from uh, our everyone's friend, uh, Mike Buff. And Mike Buff, I, I, was, I was being funny and I, I basically was like, hey, um, when, when, the, <laughs> like when the phone rang, I'm like, hi, Mike Buff. And Mike Buff is like, and, and he goes, this isn't Mike Buff. And I was like, oh. 
So I checked the phone again. It says Mike Buff. And he goes, this is Mike, Buff, Mike Buff's friend, Mike Miranda. He's like, but you might know me as Hollywood Mike Miranda. Like, you're going to have to go with the Hollywood part first, right? Like You should have went like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I didn't get oh, it. Oh, that Mike Miranda. Right. As opposed to all the other Mike Mirandas in the world that I would know for calling from Mike Buff's phone number. Yeah, yeah. Could you put Buff on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you guys, it is our uh, – it is our – I mean, pleasure is, is not the right word. Uh, it is our stoke to introduce you to your friend, my friend, Craig's friend, Mike Buff's friend, Dave Volker's friend, everybody's friend, Hollywood Mike Miranda. What's up, Mike Miranda? Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, I tell you what, I do feel like your friend. Uh, absolutely your friend. Uh, I feel like I'm a friend to everybody that rides BMX. If you ride a bicycle, I'll tell you right now, brother, I am your friend. Uh, I love it. Love it. Thank you guys so much for having me on it. It means the world to me to be able to talk to you about something that I still love. Uh, and again, you know, I, I just feel that kinship, that friendship, that family with everyone that rides a, rides a BMX bike or any bike really, but really you see somebody on a BMX bike, whether they're 29 inch, 26 inch, 20 inch wheels, man, a side hack. I love you. Yeah, we're family. We're <laughs> That's family. amazing. I love it. That's amazing. Uh, one thing I'm going to prompt you with real quick is when you're talking, the way Zoom works is the microphone's going to it's going to pick you up and move the camera to you. Um, you're going to see Craig and I reacting like yeah because we can't talk and get excited because it'll change the video back to us. So you'll see us doing stuff like getting excited, but that's that's just us being excited without without trying to change the camera view back to us. Well, so, if I get excited, you won't see because it's the, I have my computer high enough. You won't see any excitement down here. Smart okay. man. Smart <laughs> man. <laughs> hey, Mike. So welcome to the show, man. Like Isaac said, man, and, and I just second it fully is a, a huge honor to have you here. Thanks, bro, for showing up. Um, with my intro, we were talking about the movie Rad. Um, I kind of want to just kick it off right there. We're going to get into a lot of cool stuff tonight. Your energy's good. We're stoked. You're stoked. So what about those scenes, man? Take us back to 86, man. Let's, let's go ahead and talk about it because a lot of uh, fun times looked like they were had. Dude, what was your experience back then with that well, whole movie? Be, before I start off, let me throw a shout out to my buddy, Martin Buckley, who, who sorted me out with this kit and he and sent me jersey and pants. So I've got the full uniform. And uh, as soon as I can get to Los Angeles, we're going to see this whole kid out in front of the Hollywood sign. I promised him. Got to oh, do yes. it. All right. Well, let me give you the lowdown, the real lowdown on the movie Rad. It was, uh, it was a blast to make because we made it a blast to make. Uh, shooting a movie is not fun. It's really, there's a lot of downtime. You are, you know, they shoot for 20, you shoot for 20 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, and then it's cut, and then they move everything. So you've got hours of downtime. And you know, when you see the movie, it, when you watch the races, you, you, it seems like we're doing a lap. We never rode more than a section and a half of the track at a time and then cut and then we'd move to somewhere else. And it might not even be the next section of track. Uh, but it was, uh, let me tell you, it was a blast. It was, uh, it, was not, it, it was not what you think it is, but it was a lot different and it was still great. Uh, it was cold. Dude, it was Canada. It was cold. Right. And, you know, when you would talk, everyone steam would come out of your mouth. But on the movie, you don't see it. I, I don't know why, but you don't see it. There's no steam coming out. Uh, but it was uh, it was scary. It was scary when we first got there. The dirt was super soft, and I have to I have to give a, a shout out to my boy Rick Moliterno. Uh, I will fear, carry this guilt for the rest of my life. Um, you, you notice in the scene where Rick has his leg up and he's got the, yeah, my bad. It's totally my bad. I, as you guys have, may have heard, if not, I'm a bit of a practical joker. And, uh, and Buff will concur, I'm really a practical joker. Well, one of the days on the set, we go up and there's this section with all the moguls. You guys may remember that on the Q course. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. I, I went up there and I was packing the first. At first, when I rode over them, my front wheel just sunk right into it. I was like, oh, man, this is terrible. So I, I went up and I was 
pick, acting like I was packing the first one with my foot. And then uh, Moliterno wrote up to me, who is a great writer. Uh, I would say he may have been the best overall writer in the movie. Because you guys know the guy is a great ramp rider, can do flatland. But people don't realize the guy was a hell of a racer. He was super fast. Um, I mean, between him and DMC, you're talking, and Mike Buff, guys that were super fast racers, but could also do everything else. Those Iowa and, boys, man, I'm telling uh, you. Well, Buff's no Iowa boy. No, 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 no. <laughs> but those, like the Midwest, dude, those Midwest guys, they were like, man, they just did it all. Like, oh, it's summertime, I flatland. Oh, it's wintertime, I ride ramp. Oh, man, and, yeah. and fast racers. Anyway, packing the, pack the front of the jump, Molotrino rides up and says, hey, man, what are you doing? I said, oh, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to jump them all. Just, just hit this first one and jump them all. And then I, and he was looking at, I roll back. He rolls back next to me. And he says, oh, yeah, I'll do it, too. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, go ahead. I'm going to tie my shoe. So I bend down, <laughs> tie my shoe, takes off, hits the first one, front wheel sticks, and he goes flying over the bars. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> And my boy, I think he tore his ligaments in his knee or something, man. Oh, man. Ricky, yeah. if, if you ever hear this or if you hear the story, please, uh, on bended knee, I'm so sorry, man. I've carried that guilt forever. It's just a joke. But, you know, that's what happens. Uh, and if anybody ever hears um, uh, Mike say, hey, I'm going to tie my shoe, oh, look out, dude. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> or, hey, or, hey. You go first. No, just don't do it. <laughs> but the crash scenes, you know, that was a crash that didn't get filmed. There were a lot of crashes that got filmed. There were free stunts and they were paid stunts. We just call them stunts and free stunts. Here we go. This was this was one of yes. my big questions right here. Yeah. Because I don't know if I don't know if you know this, but there's like there's it's urban lore that you got paid five hundred dollars for every one of your falls. And so that so people are like oh man that that was a paid fall that was a paid fall dude we heard that who who told i mean did did eddie fiola kind of hint to that or make not, mention I, of that in his podcast i'm well, not gonna rat anybody out but i'm gonna say oh i just did eddie fiola totally i think eddie fiola mentioned it <laughs> it's on youtube dude it's not ratting anybody out <laughs> so the way it happened was uh jose yanez de cat goes out to do backflips and i heard I heard that he was getting 1500 bucks for every backflip he did. Even the practice ones, the ones where he crashes, $1,500, $1,500, $1,500. Well, I was going to get me some of that. <laughs> I said, uh, I, I, one day, we, the, the first day we're going to shoot, the very first scene we're going to shoot is going around the berm. That's scene number one that we shot on the track. And so I walked up to Hal Needham and I said, I've already gotten in trouble with him a couple of times. So he knew me already. I said, uh, Hey, Hal, you know, what would be really awesome is if somebody went flying around the room and didn't make it and flew off the berm. And he goes, yeah, that would be good. And I said, and I'll do it. I'll do it for you for $500. And he was like, all right, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so the very first scene, dude, I just went straight at, I, you can see the thing. I just went straight at it jumped off and yanked my bike over the berm had no you know who crashes on purpose I, I didn't know what i was doing i was no stunt man but i sure did it flew over and on the other side no airbag no pads it was a row of cardboard boxes <laughs> i just fell into boxes so i got up did it it was great i was like hey yeah you know my two favorite words ching ching <laughs> right there got my money it was great got paid so, uh, you know, maybe a week later, might have been two weeks later, we were doing cliff, the cliffhanger, the jump up, which, by the way, for BMX guys that didn't ride vert, that was, you know, that was tough. That was something that was completely new. You know, I don't, I don't think like some of the guys, Scott Clark, some of the guys didn't do it. They just didn't, didn't film that scene because they weren't comfortable doing it. Um, but as we go to film that scene, I walked up to Hal Needham and I said, hey, Hal, you know what would be cool? If somebody didn't make it and fell all the way down, <laughs> he just starts cracking up and he looks at me and he says, okay, Hollywood, how much is that going to cost me? <laughs> and so I, I gave him a number. He didn't flinch. 
suited and booted and off we went. You know, it's levels like three stories down, all the way down, cardboard boxes. Knocked the wind out of me. I, you know, I came off crawling out of the boxes, couldn't breathe, walked right up to him and said, how about another take? <laughs> <laughs> it was, a, you know, I think it was a thousand bucks, or it was a thousand dollars to do that. So I made 1500 bucks extra. It was a gas. Just had such a good time. The wind's amazing. knocked out of you. Out of you. You're like, cha-ching. <laughs> cha-ching. I'll, do, no. I'll do another I got, one. <laughs> I got my name mentioned. And a week, listen, I'm 56 years old. A week in my life doesn't go by that somebody doesn't mention it. I get, but my favorite thing to do is every time I see somebody out on the street that has a rad t-shirt on, <laughs> I love to go up next to them. Hey, do you mind if I take a picture with you? Take a, they have no idea. Dude, they, you had a post like that with two guys and, and, and you're standing with them and the captain's like, these dudes had no idea and you've got the thumbs up and they're just like, well, I guess one guy was like, uh, okay, you know, kind of like, well, who's this dude? Oh. <laughs> Who's a weird guy wanting to take, her, take a selfie with us? But my wife and kids, though, they love, they, they love to get me. They love to, hey, that's, that's my dad. He was in rad. They love to do that all the time. Oh, it's that's a crack amazing. Thing. That's yeah. amazing. Do you, okay, so, Craig, that's your first memory of Mike Miranda. My first memory of Mike Miranda was in... Uh, it had to be, it was BMX action, could have been BMX plus, but I'm pretty sure it was BMX action. And Mike, what I remember the most was, was not, so the things I remember most was, was reading about how, how much bike control you had on the track, how skilled you were at that. But what I remember the most was these incredible like cross-ups that you would do. Like it was like disjointed elbow. So like Craig, you'd see a cross up and you'd see guys doing this and then, you know, and it's cool, but then you'd see Mike and it was like, like elbows, like in the wrong direction. And I'm like, all right, you know, and so here I am trying to be like a little scrub out there and I'd be like, just like a 90 degree turn. And we're like, and, and as kids, when you jump, you'd go, Mike Miranda, <laughs> you just jump and you'd yell. Hollywood. Called it out. Yeah, you would call it out. Mike, like, how did, was that something that, that just came natural to you? Or, or did you like, how, yeah. did it, how did that happen? Well, it happened, it happened because like most, if you talk to a lot of BMX pros of my era or before, they all say the same thing. Oh, I wanted to race motocross, but my parents wouldn't let me or I couldn't afford it. I wanted to be a motocross guy too. Hold on one second. I wanted to be a motor. I wanted to be Roger DeCoster. <laughs> I wanted to be a motocross guy, uh, but my parents said no, 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 no way. You're not getting a motorcycle. So I started. I raced BMX instead. And but when I rode BMX, all those years I rode before I raced was always jumping and mimicking the motocross guys. You know, you turn it sideways like Billy Grassi, or you pull forward like Palmer or, you know, do a Hannah. You did all these things and that's what you called it. You just did whatever the motocross guys did. And so I just found that every time I'd go over a jump or lift my wheel, it just felt better to lean it sideways or kick it out a little bit. And, and funny enough, my teammate, Charles Townsend, when, in, when he was inducted into the BMX Hall of Fame, he made fun of me. <laughs> He said that the same thing that everyone else would be racing around the track and someone would be in the back just doing kickouts all the time. He goes, ah, oh, that's, that's the guy that's mimicking Mike Miranda because uh, it just is. And now when I see videotapes of me racing and that's how old they are videotapes of me racing, I'm, it seems like I'm always crossing it up or doing something. And listen, if there's two, if there's two double, if there's two jumps on a track, they're doubles for me. I'm going to jump them. That's all I wanted to do is jump them. I'm sure like you guys, like a lot of guys that did freestyle, racing was where you went to do it on the weekends. But what you really loved doing was riding your bike. For me, it was riding my bike. I went to races because that's where the jumps were. When I started, I, it was just about jumping, just about riding and jumping. So I appreciate the compliment of having some style and you know, in the beginning of BMX, there were a couple of guys I saw that I was like, wow, that guy's got style. John Cruz was definitely one of them. 
everything that guy did, everything he did had style. If he, if he was just pulling up for a small jump, he had a little, he had that groove, man. He was just so cool. I love that. Yeah. And that's one of the things we've talked with, with other guests that we have. And it's almost like Isaac and I could look at even a silhouette of you or a lot of other writers and be like, that's Mike Miranda. That's this guy. That's this guy. Because of things like Isaac mentioned, you know, the really extreme, you know, cross up or, or whatever it is. So it's like, that's so cool that everyone was bringing their own little, you know, flavor to the game and, and, and to the race. And you and I were talking earlier, um, you know, you talk about your motocross guys that you looked at like, oh yeah, that guy did this with the bars or he, you know, kind of twist it and turn it and make it his own. We were talking about um, Evil Knievel and the influence he had. You want to talk about jumping bikes, man. I can, I think that's for me really what got me on a bike. It was like, I want to go jump something and it could be the curb with a, a piece of plywood on it or a, a cinder block, but I just wanted to get some air. I just wanted to be in the air. Like I'm not touching anything. I'm floating in the air, you know, evil can evil style trying to just mimic the great, you know, st stunt rider, evil can evil dude. And maybe I, in my mind, I was going over the Canyon or I was, I was jumping the, the fountain at uh, in Vegas or whatever. Right. Isaac. I mean, did you ever have that Mike where you were like, you know, I just want to, I just want to get gnarly out there. I want to, I want to go crazy and, and have fun. Our next door neighbor she worked at Ontario Motor Speedway. And that's, and Evil Knievel came and did a jump there. And so I was, I was lucky enough to go see Evil Knievel jump live once. And even before that, I was absolutely hooked. Uh, I had taken, you know, on my Schwinn Stingray, I had taken my sister's red nail polish and painted stars all the way down the frame and would tie a white, uh, bath towel around my neck and we jumped trash cans and I, I was like 10 years old 11 years old jumping as many trash cans as I could and wrecking but that was it I mean that was evil Knievel he's certainly one of the four most influential men in my life evil Knievel uh, and later in life uh, I got to meet him and become friends with him and uh, uh, I will tell you two funny evil Knievel stories one, when he would call into my office at GT Bicycles, and I would be in the warehouse, and there would be a announcement over the entire company, over the loudspeaker, <laughs> Mike Miranda, Evil Knievel's on the phone. <laughs> oh, that's so sick, dude. was <laughs> it great? Yeah, just run in to talk to Evil. And he had the most distinctive talking voice. He is great. Uh, and my, my second Evil Knievel story is... Um, I've worked in the bike business my whole life. It, from a kid in a bike shop, uh, through working for sponsors, through working today, I'm still in the bike business. I, I, I still live and breathe bikes. Uh, but I left for a short period of time to try to become a golf pro. Well, Evil Knievel was a golf fanatic. Oh yeah. Really? And I worked at a private country club in Los Angeles, a very prestigious club in Los Angeles. And when Evil would come to L.A., he would call me and we would go play golf. And, uh, dude, he, he would want to bet on everything. He, he would say, Hollywood, I will bet you $100 the next dog that we see will be brown. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he played whip out. Whatever you bet, it was right there. You whip the money out right then. And the first time we played together, I, I beat him out of some money. And I said, oh, you're your boyhood hero. Oh, no, Evil, I, I can't take you. I can't. He goes, you will take my money because when you lose, I will take yours. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I took Evil Evil's money. Dude, what was his golf game like? Did, did he, could he, like, get the club around pretty quick and, you know? His hands were <laughs> Smangled his hand. I couldn't believe he could get his, his claws around a golf club because his hands were so busted up. But he had a handicap and he knew how to play to it and he knew how to get under other players' skin. He would bring a special caddy and she was smoking hot. And so it would be a distraction to you. She you know, would bend over to pick up his ball and wipe it off, and you'd be distracted. And that's that's he played oh, every. He he had the mental game. 
oh, dude, he, he'd have you concentrating on what color the next dog was instead of your next shot. <laughs> oh, so, that's dude, funny. Uh, he, psych- was, he was great. He was psych great. out factor. Uh, <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of clubs are you swinging? What kind of do I play now? Yeah. Uh, I'm playing I have Strix on. Okay. Yeah, some forged irons. Nice. I, you know, and I seldom play anymore. Uh, maybe once a year. I usually play in the BMX Hall of Fame golf tournament. And that's more about spending time with my brothers right. and sisters than it is about the golf. But that's I pretty sure fun. love playing. Sure I, love found, playing. I found a pair of pink blue, like some pink blue dots, which is what I used to, what I used to swing in high school. So I was like super stoked. Found them on offer up for a hundred bucks. Has nothing to do with our BMX interview. I'm just like to tell everyone that I swing some <laughs> pink blue dots. Um, well, my <laughs> first set of clubs, my very first set of clubs came from, uh, a BMX dad, Greg Frederick's dad. I don't even go Greg Frederick is. He's a great Hutch teammate from Maryland and his, or Pennsylvania, and his dad gave me a set of clubs. And uh, I used to play on Mondays after the Nationals. I'd stay and play at whatever town I was in and loved, just loved the game. It was a gas. Yeah. It's a fun game. It's, it's, it's a fun game. It's a lot like BMX where it's like you again, like you, it's a group but it's really you against an obstacle. It's the same type of thing. And you're always, you're always chasing perfection, you know? And it's mental. And after Uh you train for BMX, you know, it's, it's funny that it's no secret that the the recipe for success, I learned it before BMX. I I waited to apply it to BMX and I've applied it to everything else I do. It's, it's, it's the same thing I've tried to pass on to my children. It's not that difficult. The difficult part is the discipline to do it. That's the hard part. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many distractions, especially nowadays for kids. It's hard. It's much harder now than it it was for me. Oh, I can't imagine. Like, I look at my kids now and I'm like, y'all have it hard. Like with zero social interaction, everything that you do is recorded and, and kept forever on a cell phone. It's absolutely terrifying. I'm scared to death for my kids. My kids are 12. And I'm like, man, you guys, everything you do is documented. Thank God, nothing from my childhood is documented other than like old burned out Polaroids, which is perfect for me because <laughs> none, of my, none of my mistakes are like held on in, in a cloud somewhere. Um, yeah. Isaac, yeah, you were talking about, talking about Polaroids right there. Man, don't you have a Polaroid that, that's pretty infamous that, that you want to bring up? Yeah, so... It, this is what's funny. So, okay. When I was a kid, I lived, I lived in Northern California and I went to the Stockton fairgrounds BMX track. That was my home track. Um, technically my home track, I don't think was even associated with ABA or NBA or NBA or anything like that. Um, my home track was, was called the Lodi racetrack. And it was basically, I'm pretty sure it was just like a dude that made a bootleg like track in the field and I remember the uh, the gate was was made out of wood, and before before the races, you would have to go out and weed it yourself. Like all the riders would go have to weed the weed the track, uh, and if you fell into, and if you fell off of the track, you landed in like thistle bushes, like thorns, and it was sketchy, dude. It was the sketchiest <laughs> track you've ever seen, and it was like maybe ten kids would show up, and so it wasn't like there was like like nine ten novice. It was like boys and girls like boys versus girls so you that what you'd show up maybe you're racing a kid that's 16 expert maybe you're racing a kid that's just the first time but you know you pay i think you paid a buck maybe <laughs> you know and like the trophy was like a xerox you know like hey you you did it kind of a thing like it was sketchy but then in stockton we had that was where the the aba track was and and uh um that was the big that was like the big dog track and so um you know, the, every time I talk about this, cause I have pictures with like all of my favorite riders and one of them happens to be Mike Miranda. Um, and I, I, I went over to, to see if I could find this so I could show it to you on this, on the podcast. But unfortunately, Mike, it's a, uh, it's a Polaroid from like 1983 or something like that. Yeah. Right. And um, so like when I found the, the box of Polaroids, they're all kind of stuck together and like when I open it up, I'm like, well, there's Mike Miranda. But if I were to hold it up and show you, like I have to wear glasses and I can barely see it. It's kind of like a sepia brown, like blur right now. But I do have an autograph that says Hollywood Mike Miranda on it, which is kind of cool. 
But I think right. I think you were like 15. I was maybe 12. I mean, we were both just kids standing there. Um, but I probably I do, still had a mustache. I probably still had a mustache. Dude, everybody had a mustache. And that, that leads me to my next question. Okay. <laughs> In, in 80s BMX, who, because you have guys like, you had like Greg had, had the big like, um, I've, for some reason, I, I kind of remember Pistol Pete had a, had a mustache or some type of facial mm-hmm. hair for a moment. He had a mustache. Um, Stu for a moment. Uh, and then I think yours is probably the most iconic of everybody's mustache. Who would you say had the most power stash? in OG racing back in the day? And follow up, when did you grow yours? To answer the first question, who had the second best mustache? Fair enough, fair enough. I would have to say Donnie Atherton. It was always, it was thick, it was wide, and it was perfectly groomed. In the Magnum PI cop fireman, you know, perfect mustache world it was and you know you run the jofa and let it rub and it still came out perfect that was it <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, mine started when i was like 12 and my older sister would make fun of me but i let it go because i was trying to look older i thought oh yeah Mac, that was when magnum pi was on i thought oh yeah the ladies are gonna love this and, you know, maybe the moms and the older sisters did, but not the girls my age. Oh, man. Uh, I, it, and, it, and I've kept it, I kept it, mo- you know, as long as it was cool enough to keep. And then when I shaved it off, it was a shock after having one for so long. Yeah. But I still, you know, I'm still rocking some facial hair. I could yeah. have a good one, too, if I just sharpied it. Put a little Sharpie on there, it'd be fine. Oh, dude, you and me both, brother. I got to oh. tell you, so, so my wife had never seen Rad. Um, and, uh, and this is to, to your credit, my wife is, is 12 years younger than I am. She's 30. She's about what? 35. Yeah. She's 35. Um, and we just were watching rad. And then of course, you know, you know where I'm going with this, like the, the, the whole like introduction scene pops up and she's like, that guy's hot. And I'm like, Hollywood Mike Miranda. And she's like, what did you say? I'm like, that's Hollywood Mike Miranda, babe. And she's like, that stash is dope. And I was like, right on. <laughs> you know, I like, think that was funny. So like, it's such an iconic thing, dude. Like, I think that's what's the, the best part of the whole thing. Um, especially like back then, it was really hard to kind of get a personal brand. You know what I mean? Nowadays, people are, you know, you look at, you look at most sports, you have like, you know, Rodman comes to mind where, where Rodman just like, you know, like you, you set yourself apart um, because here's the thing, you may not be, it doesn't matter if you're the best or the worst, as long as people remember who you are, you're going to get that magazine coverage. And so, you know, for you, you always had style. You always had, I always felt like your uniform was always just straight up put together. Like, I don't remember, I don't know if you were the first to wear the rock guard, but you were the first I remember to wear like the JT rock guard, you know what I mean? And, and like, you look like an action figure on a bike. Like everything was always dialed. Like the, and I'm, I sh- you shouldn't do this when you're hosting a podcast. Never cover your mouth. But I'm just going to, like the Jofa, the, the goggles, everything was just on point. Was that something that, like, that you set out to do? Or is that something you just realized, like, man, when this happens, I, I land covers. I land two-page spreads. Oh, I, I said that Evil Kaneva was one of the four most influential men in my life. Number two, not in that order, but number two would be Oz. Bob Osborne from BMX Action, you know, Bicycle Motocross Action, because he taught us what it was to be dialed. You know, he, if you were not dialed, your picture wasn't going in the magazine. And that gave us that, that level, you know, same with you guys. We all wanted to be the guy in the magazine, right? So I wanted to be that guy too. I, you know, I had, I had all those pictures on, on stapled to my bedroom wall. I, I was that kid. Uh, you know, I was not, I was not a good racer for way too long. I raced for a long time before I got my first trophy. I was just a kid that was out there having a great time on my bike. And I learned how to do all those jumps by studying those magazines. So to your point, Bob Osborne taught me how to keep it all dialed in. How, to, how your, you know, I would see a picture of the Mongoose guys, the team, 
you know, to me that in the beginning, when I first started, that was it. There were, there were other big name. I mean, Stu Thompson was the best. He was number one, but the mongoose team had everything just dialed in. And that's to me was, that was the way to look. And I wanted to be that. I wanted to be that on point. It, the picture in your, in your background, you'll see that helmet. I'm stoked to say it. part of being dialed in was being the first guy to have a Troy Lee painted helmet. Yeah. And if you guys want to look, I'll talk right now so you can see it. I'll move out of the way. It might get a little blurry, but. Troy Lee from my hometown, Corona. He, uh, you know, he was, he, again, a guy that always has everything dialed, wanted to be like him. And, you know, he was cool enough to paint my helmets for, in his, in his, he had a place at the airport, a hangar, and he painted helmets inside the hangar and he, uh, he painted my helmets. Still I think that's so cool because, excuse me, you mentioned something that, um, <coughs> excuse me, Mike, um, that Isaac and I grew up doing too. We looked through magazines. We looked through uh, trick sequence photos, trying to figure out this and, and, and how did they get into that? How do they, they, what's the evolution? How do they ride out of it? You know, and the fact that you just mentioned that was it, I mean, so you're, <laughs> You're essentially like coming up through the ranks or you're racing at the point at this time, but you're also figuring things out as well. I mean, you're like, whoa, this guy, this guy, and this check out this and that. And, and the influence of Oz, you know, and, and RL was talking about it too, um, being on point, being put together, tip, you know, from, 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 from the top to bottom, right? And so you're all these things, but at what point did you – think to yourself or, or what came about that you were like thrust up into those ranks where you're going up with Stu, you're going up with PK, Greg Hill, oh. uh, Pete. Um, I mean, was that surreal for you, man? Because here you are looking at the magazines and, and, and studying this stuff. And then, then you're, you're at the gate. I mean, you're in the, you're in the mains or you're in the pro class. And, and it, were you like, wow, I'm here. It's funny that you mentioned that. My wife and I were talking about that very thing yesterday came up in conversation of all things. And my wife and I never talk BMX. We don't talk bicycles other than she wants to know why her chain squeaks. It's because I refuse to oil it because I'm trying to slow her down. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, we were just talking about being intimidated. And uh, you know, it's funny that that just never happened to me. I was blessed by having the world's greatest dad. Um, he was a the biggest influence in my life. And he was a motivator. He trained me to be great at a sport. And it wasn't BMX, but everything I learned applied to BMX and that's what helped. And it, a big part of it was you never be intimidated by the other person. It, the conversation my wife started talk was about pain. It was about pain. And my dad told me that pain is just your body telling you this hurts, don't do it anymore. It's self-preservation. But you can choose, you can choose through training, you can choose to ignore it. Ignore, ignore the signal and keep doing what you're doing. And so by the time I got to, you know, got to the part where I was racing guys with big names, it was like, oh, so wait, he puts his pants on the same way I do. I just wasn't, inf I just wasn't intimidated by them. And, uh, you know, very proud to say, I, I love saying it's may not be a big deal to some, but it, you know, for me, it's always a big deal that I was the only single a pro first single a junior pro to win the pro open. So I was, I was not ranked with the big guys, but I beat them at a national. And then in the, when I finally moved, when I got moved up, to the big pro class, my very first race was the United States Grand Prix at Magic Mountain, a big money race. And I won my first race. It, I just wasn't intimidated by, by their personalities or by, of course, I looked up to them in the magazine. And to be honest, I still look up to them. I still, I mean, I go riding on Fridays with Perry Kramer and he still peaked. He's PK Ripper. I mean, he's, I still get the goosebumps knowing that I get to be friends with him. Uh, in, in next September, I'm going to be going on, there's a Mighty Moe's BMX cruise to the Bahamas. And uh, it's, it's a cruise that's going to honor Stu Thompson. And I called and asked, could I please go? I'll pay everything. I just want to go because I want to emcee the event so I can honor 
the, to me, the greatest writer, writer ever. He was the big number one when I was a kid. So it's, you know, e even though I would go to his house and do gate starts, I would practice with him. He was still, oh, it's due. But it didn't influence, it didn't, it didn't influence me in, 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 or intimidate me in any way. He was just another guy that got in the gate next to me. And I thought when I got in the gate next to him, I thought I could beat him. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, and, and to guys like myself and Eric group, we're not, we're not big guys. We're not tall guys. And when it became popular, this might be un, unpopular to say, but when it became popular to uh, juice up, we just didn't, we didn't, for, we, we made a decision that we weren't going to do that. We weren't going to get bigger and stronger in that way. We were going to do it the old fashioned way by just riding harder. And, uh, and I'm proud of that decision. I'm proud. I, li I listened to my dad and I did it my way and, and uh, not, not being, not to brag too much, but for who I am and what I did and where I came from, I am just so proud of what I've done. And, uh, and, and, and I don't tell my kids, they have to find out through the internet, <laughs> but, and, and through stories they hear from my friends and these podcasts, they're going to find out some other things, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. I do hope you, I answered your question. You did. I, I, I would say I think you did. Um, that, and that brings me, that's a good question. Like, I, I, it never really dawned on me as a kid because I, I think I was too young to realize, like, oh, well, and, and I don't know if I should bring up names. I don't know. Maybe I will. If you grew up, in, if you grew up looking at BMX, there was definitely a time when you noticed, like, oh, wow. Look how big that dude got. <laughs> um, do you think, do you think that um, steroids in BMX, do you think that ruined? Because for me, it, it just like, I, I feel like in, in other sports, you, you, it just gives such an unfair advantage to most athletes, you know, like, yes, you're, it just seems like you would gas so much faster um, you know, with that much more body mass, um, and the oxygen, and the lactose in your thighs. I mean, I, I mean, maybe I, you know, you have Olympic sprinters doing it. So I guess maybe you won't, but it just doesn't seem like it was a, a huge, did you see a huge advantage from, um, the folks that, that, cause I mean, you were in the middle of it. I was on the outside looking in and there was definitely, I would say, I can count three dudes that I remember in BMX action and BMX plus. I specifically remember one spread where you see a dude in the off season and Mike, you're going to, everybody's going to know who it is, but I'm not calling a name, but you saw them on the bench and here they are lifting and they're talking about like how hard they applied themselves in the off season. And you're like, bro, you look like Hulk Hogan compared to last season <laughs> when you look like everybody else. That um, wasn't chicken noodle soup, man. That wasn't chicken noodle soup. They were down in. No. Uh, and, do you think it affected BMX and, and do you think, uh, what was it like racing against them? Did you notice a huge difference or? Let me say you used the word ruined and I, and I won't go that far, but it yeah. definitely changed BMX. Yeah. It changed the sport of BMX racing. And I, and I think the reason the way, the way it did was it also influenced the way tracks were being built. Suddenly tracks didn't have a lot of big jumps. Because as these guys got, as those guys got bigger, their skills definitely diminished. Their riding skills definitely diminished. But man, they were strong. And that same guy you're talking about came to my practice track. <laughs> and and we, 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 you know, I was fortunate that in, in, in our hometown, we had our own practice supercross track. And he drove up, got his bike out, rode around, put his bike back in the truck and left. And he said, well, I don't need to practice this. I don't need to, we don't, we don't ride tracks like this. He, he just wanted to go and do sprints because the tracks ended up changing because the rider's physiques changed and the premium became just power down the straightaways and you could roll over the jumps. There weren't any, it wasn't technical. And if, if the track was really technical and tough, people, guys like myself and Eric Roop, did much better because you had to rely on skill. You had to rely on skill. Now, some guys were naturally fast and naturally buff. And you, you take my twin brother, Tommy Brackens. He, 
he was a human dragster. I mean, that guy, he, he, didn't, he didn't have a good diet and he, he didn't do anything. He didn't lift weights, but he rode like a maniac. And he was just talented with fast twitch muscles that could spin really fast. And he was so strong. And he's just a phenomenal athlete and is a great diver off a high dive. Can't dance and he likes the Beatles, just so you know. <laughs> I would have never thought any of that. All I remember, when you say that name, all I can think of was like, I remember like thinking like that dude's legs look like tree trunks, <laughs> like look like tree trunks. So like, strong and so lean and such a great racer. You know, we, yeah. we moved in together as roommates and it was when I left my parents' house and he left his parents' house. So it was, uh, we grew up together. I, you could say that we grew up together. And uh, that first night was crazy. You know, he, <laughs> he, he, we get in, he puts everything away. Everything's folded. Everything's just in. And me, I just shoved everything in the room. Just whatever, threw my mattress on the ground and just slept. And I got up in the morning and I went in his room and dude, he tucks, he got in bed and he tucks the sheets in around him and he sleeps perfectly <laughs> still. And then he just opens his eyes and he, I screamed like a girl. He, he's, <laughs> he is, he, we always say he's my twin brother. We are, we are two peas in a pod and uh, I love him dearly. Uh, but the sport of BMX changed. And when it did, Tommy benefited from it because his ability to just ramp up speed was incredible. And so were those guys. And, yeah. you know, we, all of us had the opportunity and we had the choice, but some of us didn't. Some of us just didn't. I want to talk about another change, Mike. Um, you know, early 80s, because um, you rode through the 80s, uh, like from, I'm going to say professionally, like 81 through 86, somewhere around that that timeline correct and uh you speak about the changes in bmx so when when racing was the hottest commodity in bmx um did you notice that the era was changing to freestyle were you were you, did you happen to go what are these guys doing in the parking lot after the race who are these guys that are now getting in the magazine they're not racing they're 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 on their front tire doing something or they're on the on these pegs or did you happen to think to yourself like, man, what's going on here? Because, you know, it was racing and then it seemed like it transitioned and then freestyle blew up and it was like, whoa, we've got two eras going on here. Um, Isaac and I lived through that. So what was it like being a pro racer going, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on with freestyle? I, I remember the day I saw it. The day I saw it was the day we went to a race in Mexico. And uh, yeah, went down to Mexico to race BMX. And uh, we were riding the day before the races in Mexico on the streets with uh, Bob Haro and Bob Morales. And, and uh, I saw Bob Haro put his front brake on and do a front nose wheelie all the way down and then a rock walk. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> I mean, that day I could have quit racing and just become a freestyle. I just loved it. Um, but I, I did see a difference and I saw that guys like Bob Haro, and he, he's the guy I always say, I talk about it, put together guy who had always was dialed in. And when I saw him, he was not a big guy and he, he NRL same, not, uh, didn't see the success in racing but phenomenal riders. And so they found a, an avenue to showcase their skills, to show people, hey man, I'm a, I'm a great rider. Not good, great rider. And through the magazines, they got, it, it got to showcase that you don't have to be a racer to enjoy this, you don't to enjoy this family. You don't, you don't have to be a, uh, you know, you don't have to win trophies. You can just be a kid on a bike having a great time. And uh, so, yeah, I saw it change. I think I was one of the pros that didn't have, uh, there was no animosity. There wasn't a split in the field because you're a freestyler. We can't be friends. That's, that was not me. That's just not my personality. Um, some of my, it sounds like cliche to say, but some of my best friends were freestylers, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's true. Uh, you know, I, I had nothing but nothing but the most respect. The, the first time I saw Kevin Jones, 
do his thing of, of you know, at, a, at an AFA contest, come out and not pedal, just scuff his entire routine. I was, I, I thought that is the greatest thing I've ever seen on a bicycle. Yeah, it's pretty cool because I was thinking about guys who've transitioned from race into freestyle. And I think of Buff. Um, Buff was a, I mean, a lot of people think, you know, Buff was just a freestyler. Well, guess what, man? Buff could race. If you, and if you were paying attention back then, you know, Buff yeah. could. About three weeks quick. ago, <laughs> about three weeks ago, he texted me a snapshot, a snapshot of a mag, of a result in a magazine at a race where he got second and I got third, and he texted that to me. Right, that's that's of definitely course. a Mike Buff move. That is definitely yeah. a Mike Buff move. Yeah. Um, he was, man, he was fast, fast. But again, I I would say you know Dennis McCoy and Rick Moliterno, there were a lot of guys that were really fast. I mean, and and going to going to my home away from home, going to Woodward Camp in Pennsylvania, you would see guys that could, Joe Johnson was another guy that was horror rider. Holy cow, that guy could jump, he could race. He would do gate starts. He would practice with the pros doing gate starts at the track at night on his freestyle bike with his pegs and gyro and all nine yards, you know, 20 pounds heavier bike. And he, dude, he was a baller. That's incredible. Yeah. And, and here's the one thing I like I always thought like uh I don't know, man. I always considered you kind of like an honorary freestyle guy because like when the freestyle movement moved, um, when it kind of split, I I obviously like for me, you don't know this, um, but I, I went straight freestyle um uh, because that was like I didn't have to do I could do it anytime, not just on Friday nights. And my mom didn't have to drive me anywhere. And that was like the big hang up for for BMX was like, you know, I like, couldn't fit the bike in the car, so it was like a big deal to like get my bike to the Stockton track. Um, but, but you always had style. So you were always doing something flashy and you had pink bikes. And so like I had a pink bike, you had a pink bike. So there's always that like honorary bro, honorary, you and me, like we're close. <laughs> um, tell me about like, I didn't, I didn't realize you toured with the freestyle team and, and, was that during like vision, the vision day? Like, tell me more about like the, after BMX, after you started, started, uh, you know, the freestyle scene started taking off. What, what was it like after that? What did you do to stay in bikes? Well, for a short period of time, I went to work for CW racing and uh, I, Roger, the owner of CW asked me, Magoo, who was running the freestyle program left, and so in a pinch, he asked me to come do it for him. I said, sure. So I just took the binder that Magoo had. I booked shows. And, uh, and then when it was time to go on tour, he, he didn't have anyone. He said, will you go out on tour? And I said, sure. He goes, can you announce? And I go, sure, I can announce. And I actually, you know, rode around a little bit. And the thing was great. Um, that was my, my, you know, I got to go out on the road with the, in my opinion, the rock star of, of freestyle. Hands now, there, there, there are guys that might have been more talented, got bigger air, got more television script, all that. But if there was one rock star, one rock star, it was Diz Hicks. Oh, my gosh. Have you guys ever seen the movie Almost Famous? And there's yes. a, yeah, the, well, the one guy on the, in the band gets scooped up by the locals and leaves and goes to a house party. <laughs> I swear they stole that from Diz Hicks. We were doing a show, and I think it was in Michigan somewhere. And uh, and at the end of the show, I see Diz talking to these girls, you know, and they're all, you know, they they look the part, man. And they and he climbs in the back of the Camaro, and they take off. And I was like, oh my, he didn't say anything to anyone. It's like, oh my gosh, our next show is is in two days. We have a day off, but it's like another state away. And and it was a big show. Was it Albies? I think. Yeah, it was a big show at Albies, and. Sure enough, we don't hear from him. You know, there's no cell phones. You don't hear from him for two days. The show, the show's about to start. The music started. It's time to go. And sure enough, dude, car comes skidding up. Diz gets out. It looks like a total wreck. Kissing all the girls goodbye. Gets on his bike. And brother, spot on, perfect show. He was, he was just a awesome. rock star. An absolute rock star. He was a rock star, man. He oh. almost looks like, like before his shows, like he jumped out of a, like a, his last set from, 
you know, a, a hairband concert. He's got on the studded bracelets, the, the sleeveless jersey. He's black and purple and, you know, the, the hair looking like Twisted Sister a little bit. And he's like, and then he kills it, you know? It's like, like you mentioned, dude, it's like you talk about, you know, being put together and, and, and the look and all this. He took it the whole other direction and killed it with that style. I, I'll wouldn't be honest, eat, he wouldn't eat. He wouldn't sleep. He ran out of money all the time. He'd lose this. <laughs> he spent all his food money buying sunglasses because he'd lose his. But, dude, come showtime. And, I mean, he gave it all. He left it all out there. He was just an absolute rock star. 100%. I will tell you this. Like, I was not a big Diz Fix. I wasn't, like, a big fan of Diz. Um, I, I couldn't relate to him. Like, I did not listen to metal. Um, I grew up in, like, you know, around my neighborhood, it was, like, um, you know, gangster rap and the cure, like that was it. So I, I couldn't relate to like the, the, <laughs> yeah, opposite ends of the, the spectrum. <laughs> CW did a show up in Chico or Davis. Um, and I remember we went up there to see him and, uh, what, five minutes into the show, Diz Hicks made me a believer in Diz Hicks and showed me how important showmanship playing to a crowd and not taking yourself seriously could win people over that guy on his like just who in the world like okay no disrespect to kick turn guys but kick ramps were not that technical it wasn't that hard you go up you lock your brake gravity's going to pull you back down and you're going to be fine that dude is doing like handstand twists and like he made it look good and so i can tell you like after that i it changed my i was like Kick ramps are dope. Kick ramps are super <laughs> dope. An absolute staple in any freestyle show. And if anybody tells you that they didn't go on a kick ramp, twist their bars and throw the horns, they're lying to your face right in front of Jesus and everybody. Like, don't be a liar. You you love digs like this. It's amazing. And uh, I just saw a picture on Instagram. He does custom wood flooring in Sacramento. So if you see a, a little minivan or a little mini truck driving around with the CW logo, exactly like it, custom, I think it's like custom wood flooring or something like that. That's right. Good for Diz Hicks. So if you see that guy, honk, throw the horns, and I promise you Diz will throw them back at you. Dude, and he's a dedicated father. He's, he's just a great guy. You know, he, uh, he, 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 had a, he, he had a rough 80s, <laughs> but man, he, and he lived through the 90s. Man, but he is, he's turned out to be a great guy. And uh, yeah, he was, he was tough to manage, but dude, he assaulted this, that ramp. When the first time I saw the kick ramp, I was like, dude, that's a neat, that was the evil Knievel jump ramp I was using with the towel on my neck when I was a kid. Yep. But man, he, he really, he could make, he could make magic. He was I'll great. tell you what, this is what I remember about Diz. Diz. Okay, so if you, if you went to a freestyle or a BMX race in the 80s, you remember, I call it the kid economy. So there was money and then there was sticker trading and the kid economy and sticker trading was huge. Like you'd be like, I'll give you two GT stickers for that one rare Haro sticker. It was like, we had, there was, there was, man, you could, you could put money value on it. You could be like, okay, I'll change these bars, but I'm gonna change you my bars, your bars, but a CW sticker. And Diz was cool about it, man. He's like, all right, you got a sticker. Everyone got a sticker. And he's like, you want one more for like something, you know, like for your trades? I'm like, yes, I do, Diz Hicks. Boop. <laughs> and like, Seppi was not, Seppi was super like stingy with the stickers. Diz, that dude was like, everybody, you get it. He's like, Oprah, you get a sticker, you get a sticker, you get a sticker. He got, he understood kids, man. And that's what I loved about um, the other, the other like cherry on top of Diz Hicks. So, uh, and Fantastic. And if you had a hot sick, if you had a hot sister, you probably got a T-shirt too. <laughs> yeah. His was good at finding the crowd. He could point them out, man. It was something else. You know, Robbie Morales. I'm sure you know who that is. Robbie Morales says he, he learned about business. He learned business at Woodward Camp. How we would, how we would, all the pros would just, we'd sell our number plates, our stickers. We did T-shirts. We'd bring all our swag, and that's how we, you know, that funded a lot of. For, for a lot of guys that funded their way to the next races and Robbie Morales learned business 101 in the That's cabin fun. at Woodward camp. Do you, 
do you have a favorite bike that you rode? This is one that, that I've always wanted to know, like, cause okay, being sponsored, I remember I got sponsored and I rode a bike I hated um, because it was what you did. And I'm curious, man, of all the bikes you rode, and I'm not asking you to dog anybody, but like maybe rank, like, man, what was your favorite bike? What just felt like home? What was like, yeah, this was great. Um, between like the CW, the Torker, the, the Hutch, obviously, like, do you have like favorites? Do you have ones that you're just like, you have like a warm fuzzy feeling when you think about that bike? Absolutely. Uh, if I, if I tell you just about just the bike, just the bike, hands down by far, my favorite bike was a Hutch. It's no, no question. The bike was just easy to ride short back end. Uh, I just felt at home on it that from the day I got on it, it was quick out of the gate. It could jump great. It was light. Um, I broke a few of them, but yeah, it was, dude, it was a phenomenal bike. Loved it. And still to this day, I was in Australia last fall, thanks to my great friends, Mark Tawaf and his wife, Laura, they brought me down and it was, I went with Eddie King and had the time of my life. And, 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 and ha I have a family in Australia now. Um, but I rode a 1986 pink hutch down there that some guy brought for me to look at. I rode it. I threw a leg over it. It was like I rode it last week. It was, it was fantastic. That's right. By far my favorite riding bike. And, and probably my most enjoyable sponsor. Um, but the has, one had nothing to do with the other. Before that, before that, I'd have, if I had to rank them, you know, there's a lot to rank, but I, would, I, I don't want to dog anyone. Right. I'll just say that I, I really, you know, I was a huge fan of Mongoose. So when I, when I had my Stingray, when I finally got rid of the Stingray because I broke it a, a couple of times, when I got my first real race bike, I bought a, I got a mongoose team bike. And I, you know, I, I mowed lawns. I did everything I had to do. I, that mongoose team bike was, was my dream. I had that two page ad of John George holding up that bike. I, that motivated me to go mow lawns in Riverside in the middle of summer at 106, 107, eight, nine degrees, just mowing lawns for everybody and anybody to save money. And that's, that was it. That was the bike. And when I got it, I rode it until, until it, the end. I mean, I just kept riding it. That was, that was it. Love that bike. If, if there was a bike I could have again, that'd be the bike. Craig, do you have anything to say? <laughs> I was going to say, Oh boy. Cause I think I told you, Mike, that was my first bike. 1982. Oh. Uh, I got an 81 Mongoose team, man, and I rolled that thing out of the house on Christmas morning, brother, and I was like looking to see how many heads I could, uh, necks I could break when you were turning around looking at me on that bike. I felt like the king, and I did the same thing as you. I was on a Schwinn. I don't think it was a Stingray. I want to say it was a Scrambler or something like that. Banana seat, power brakes, ape hanger bars. Rode the heck out of that bike, and when I was able to like abandon that and roll out and i'm serious i rode out of the house onto the street like who else is seeing this you know the major stoke was like i, I must have been on a cloud dude it, it was crazy so to hear you say that that's pretty cool that we we kind of transitioned from the from the schwinn you know back from the joe kid on a stingray days to now we're like i'm in the race dude I can, just, I can imagine i could just imagine like little craig boy craig walking out in the middle of like pushing his bike out to the street and then just arms up everybody take it in take oh, it in. dude here's my I, new I, bike oh bro i was in my i was in my like pajamas or robe or something it's 1982 dude i think i had my house shoes on i was like i was ready i'm like i'm not going back in no way i had the the the, the mags on it and i was like you know the sticker the prism stickers were blinding everyone you know and i was like yeah boy that's oh, yeah, yeah. I ruined a lot of my mom's washcloths, man, because I, I would come home after riding. I would wipe that thing down. Yeah. I, I, and I wasn't going to use a rag, not on my no. I went and got the washcloths out of the closet, man. No. I think we all have memories of that with like, I remember I did that when I got my first Vision Streetwear shirt. I remember walking into, like, walking into class, like, poof, door open, and then just everyone take <laughs> yeah. notice of the vision street where this means i'm different and i freestyle on my bicycle 
Life's a Beach when I had the little hat with the little pop-up thing, had the little tiny little hat and you go like that. Life's a Beach and then, or the Vision Beret or the, uh, the Vision Streetwear Fanny Pack. You just check that. Let, let me get my lunch money. Zip. Yeah, dude. Dude, we all did that stuff. I love it. Oh, yeah. You know, you know Mike, speaking of the, the pink hutch, okay, and we're going to go back into rat a little bit. Do you, there are actually, there are forums, and I want to clear this up. I, I, want, I want the people who talk about this, I want the BMX Museum guys to know what the answer is here. And it's, maybe it's been answered, but I, I would like to just put it out there. Do you still have the, the bike from the movie rad what what happened to that bike do you have it where where's it at the bike from the movie rad uh is and it, it is in the possession of a very very good friend of mine in the chicago area chris chudzik has it uh it was sort of a gift to his son um and, and let me tell you what happened that bike that exact bike uh, i didn't keep anything when, when I got home from a race, if I got something new, the kids in my neighborhood got those bikes. They got all that stuff. Nice. Um, I would, uh, my dad told me that if you get something from free, you won't, you won't take care of it. So I would tax these kids. You know, if they wanted to frame, it's 20 bucks. It was 40 bucks. It was, I never charged them, you know, any kind of real price. They would say, I'd say, oh, how much are you going to give me for it? Uh, 40. Okay, you can have it for 20. But you'd have to give me something because then you had skin in the game. And, uh, and that was the case. Uh, this, that bike, that bike complete came after, when I came home from Canada, that bike was given to a friend of mine, just given it to him. And uh, just a great guy, John Trimberger. And years go by, dec decades go by. And uh, he's, I'm driving, uh, he's, we see each other in the street and he's an electrician now and he says, Oh my gosh, are you going to be here? Well, there's something in my parents' house I have to get. And so he goes to his parents' house, gets the bike and brings it back and gives it back to me. What? Yeah. yeah. So uh, just, you know, it's just how people are. People, you know, I'm just a firm believer that people are great. No, that's cool. And, and I'm glad you cleared it up for at least me i i bet there's folks out there that go yeah the guy out in chicago has i didn't know and i just wanted to hear you know everybody wants to know did you keep stuff do you have stuff uh eddie fiola has a whole garage full of memorabilia he's got bins and bins isaac and i've seen it uh helmets and this and 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 and, and then uh you know we got guys that go i didn't keep a thing i didn't i mean rl said i didn't keep anything like nothing i've got this helmet and i've got this you know like isaac it, it kind of like is it swings way one side or the other, at least from our experience, you know? Yep. I kept my very first trophy because I raced for uh, six or seven months of losing and losing and losing. And I got my first trophy and it was, it was a fourth place in the semi. Meaning if you, if you got fourth in the semi, but you didn't make the main, they gave you a consolation trophy. After racing all that time, I got a consolation trophy. What is it? What does the placard yeah, say? Yeah, what's Mike? it say? Corona Raceway, Junior High School BMX, 2578, fourth semi. We, nice. we didn't race like yourself. We didn't race by, it wasn't a, you know, you weren't expert pro, whatever. It was, oh, you're, you're a sixth grader. You're a seventh grader. You're an eighth grader. And my home track was Corona. But before that, we had a small track like yours. It was the... Uh, OLPH BMX, Our Lady of Perpetual Help BMX track. It was in the dirt lot next to the Catholic Church that one guy, Kevin McNeil, ran races. And there was no starting gate. There was no trophy. It was just go out there and kill yourself. And the only other thing I kept was my signed picture of Stu Thompson. That is amazing. Yep. It's not, I'm thank, I'm thank God it's not a Polaroid. And it says, Stu Thompson, Mike, good luck. Good luck with you in the future. That's it. He didn't <laughs> hey. know who I was. Yeah, I was just some <laughs> punk kid bothering him, I'm sure. But he signed a picture for me and I always kept it. Well, at least it doesn't say have fun staring at my backside, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> you, you suck. Stay out of pro practice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't be squirrely. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I, I remember the, the, this, my very first race, the starting guy, um, I, I, cause you had to sign up like a waiver membership thing. Like that was like the thing, like that's how they made their money. Like you, you, you bought a membership to the track and uh, he goes, your first race. I was like, yep. And he goes, all right. He goes, you got a helmet. I'm like, yep. And it didn't fit me as a motorcycle helmet. And he, I'll never forget it, dude. He was like, he looked, this is like thin dude that kind of looked like lurch. And he goes, pedal hard, don't fall down. And that was it, dude. I was like, I should make a t-shirt. Pedal hard, don't fall down. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was my entrance. And then I did fall down and a guy rode over like my helmet. Like he, he literally like ran over my head with his bicycle. It was amazing. Uh, uh, no one told me to pedal hard. I, I just didn't fall down. I was out there just doing cross-ups and jumping, having a great time. <laughs> dude, my, my dad. With a my, cape. <laughs> <laughs> my, my dad didn't go to many races because uh, he was working all the time. But I'll tell you this, my dad went to four or five. He went to one. And for some reason, he parked right next to Tinker Juarez's dad. And Tinker, a mongoose, I was. And uh, he parked next to Tinker's dad because I think he saw that Tinker's dad was also drinking Budweiser. So they were two peas in a pod. <laughs> anyway, at the top of a, of, of a berm of the second turn. And uh, I remember coming around the track in last place, all having a great time doing cross-ups and going around the turn and taking my hand off and waving at my dad. I was in last, it didn't matter, but I was having a great time. And the next lap I come around, the next, next moto of three, I come around, I wave at my dad, hey, I'm having a great time, dad. I come around in the third moto and I go to wait and my dad's gone. He left me at the track. <laughs> I got to the finish line, he's gone. And so I, when I got home, 13 miles down to my house, to my house. I got home and my, I said, dad, what happened? Where'd you go? And he said, in the way that my dad talked, me home. I couldn't watch it. You're no good. <laughs> he hated to see me suck, but I loved, I, dude, I loved BMX. I loved riding my bike so much that it didn't matter that I sucked. It, but it, that is it, hands down it, the best story I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> just when I your own dad it. leaves you at the track. Hey, man, I'm not just going to like hang my head. I'm getting in the truck. I'll catch you at home, homie. <laughs> just just <wow. laughs> That is phenomenal. Oh, I love your dad. Oh man, he, I had, I did have the greatest dad ever. He was fantastic. He knew how to push my buttons. He knew how to make me better. And he knew when it was time for me to, to start racing, he knew what to do. But until then it didn't matter because I was just having fun. I was having fun. And throughout my career to this day, I put an emphasis on having fun. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a picture of you not smiling. That's, uh -oh. that's the other thing. Like I, I've never seen, and I, I mean, you might, you might be able to find something where like, you know, you look serious, but I, I, I've never seen it. If it's out there, I've never seen a picture where it doesn't look like you're having more fun than anybody there. Win, lose, draw. You just look like you're always having a good time. And that's like, when, when, when Craig told me like, Hey man, we're you like, I totally secured Mike Miranda for this interview. And I, I was just thinking like, man, that dude is like the happiest BMXer of all time. Because you look back at those days, at least I do. And it was like, Stu, very serious. Um, Greg, like, he'll, you just didn't even want to look at him. Like that dude was scary to look at. For a little kid like me, he was scary to look at. Um, like you look at like Harry Larry, um, also intimidating. Uh, Mike King super like looked like a cool dude. Um, Eric like Eric looked cool. You know what I mean? Like he he always, but like nobody looked like they were actually like having a great time twenty four seven. Like I remember that's it, the one thing I remember: cross ups and having a good time. Oh, that's the story of my life. <laughs> if you rode with me last Sunday on mountain bikes, it was cross ups and having a good time. Yeah, <laughs> I heard. I, I heard, I heard you, there was a little accident with some water, like you were getting your water cup filled up. Oh, no. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that's true or not. You're close. Uh, I'm still a practical joker. And so 
Friday night, this last Friday, we went riding. Uh, Buff, PK, and I went riding, and we went to dinner afterwards. And of course, we sit down to dinner, and Buff's sitting back. And so when the waiter comes by, I said, oh, can I get some more water? And I hold the glass over Buff's lap. lap and as soon as the guy starts pouring, I go, oh, that's enough. And I pull it back and just <laughs> drenches Buff's crotch. And of course, Buff does this. That just gives me the stink eye. <laughs> and Perry, Perry is just losing his mind laughing on the other side of the table. But then, you know, that's what we do. Yeah. You know, and, and Buff, you know, Buff, he's, he is a practical joker too in a lot of ways. He was at, at my bachelor party. He, uh, I knew better. I'd been getting a lot of guys at their bachelor party. So uh, I knew better. And so he was this, he was the groom at my bachelor party. Oh, it was, uh, yeah, he, he had to, he, he was the stand in. He's is a good it, guy for that. Is, is it true you dated Barbara Mandrell? While wow, Buff is telling lies on me again, isn't he? <laughs> Barbara Mandrell. <laughs> we went, that's a story for, all right. I'm not going to be one of those guys and say, I'm not going to tell that kind of story. All right. So we went to the mountain bike races. We go mountain bike racing. Buff, myself, his brother, Steve Potts from the Potts Mod. We call him Earl. We go to the mountain bike. We're going, we're racing. We're serious. We're so serious that the night before we go to the only, only biker bar in all of Big Bear and just slamming tequila and having a great old time. And I ended up, you know, with some honky tonk angel that looked like Barbara. She looked like Barbara Mandrell, you know, with the dress and the hair and the, you know, we know what it is. Went to bed. <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> Went to bed with a 10 and woke up with a two. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh man, man. Uh, i didn't podium that weekend <laughs> but if you know, buff buff probably didn't tell you that he he dated buff dated a girl with a beard <laughs> he and rl came to my hometown to do a show because he was dating this girl that had a beard a big red beard and and they came to, and you know, she would put makeup on and then she would smile and would crack open. And, but Buff loved her, Buff loved her. So he would drive all the way from the South Bay, all the way out to Riverside to do a freestyle show at her high school to get her elected for class president or something. Yeah, no wonder, no wonder Buff likes Isaac better. His beard's more See? lush than mine. <laughs> Buff, let me tell you, Buff likes beards. He's, he's a beard guy. Oh my God. Okay. So the, the last one, the last one I have, um, and this was just like a minute ago, like, so uh, Todd Lyons wants me to, wants me to ask you about the time. He was a gopher at GT and he's like, man, I got this call. And it was like, Hey, go pick up, go, you got to go pick up uh, Hollywood on the side of the five. Like your car broke down or something. And he had to go and like pick you up on the side of the road. But anyway, he just wanted me to tell you hi. He's like, Hey, Todd Lyons says hi. Dude, Todd Lyons. Let me tell you about Todd Lyons. We were teammates on CW. He was a CW racer, another fantastic racer that always had style. And dude, always, if, if there's two jumps in a straightaway, it's doubles for Todd Lyons. Love that guy. I love that he's still living the life, man. And he's, he loves bicycles just as much today as he did back then. I love that about him. Uh, and he gets more kids on bikes. And that's, you know, that's my passion, getting kids on bikes. Yeah. I love that. What? Uh, he, he's, he's, he's awesome. I'm, what? I'm a huge Todd Lyons fan. I, I, I am not a Todd Lyons fanboy, but I will tell you that, like, I absolutely love what he's done. Because for me, like, I wouldn't know Craig if it wasn't for Todd Lyons. Um, I wouldn't, we, we wouldn't have this, this podcast. We wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't for Todd Lyons, because I felt like I was a, an orphan to BMX because I didn't like, I didn't have an, I grew up on my BMX bikes. I loved the way they felt and I couldn't find a bike that felt comfortable to me. Um, and without going to a mountain bike, but mountain bikes was, it, was, it didn't feel like a BMX bike. I couldn't just like bunny hop a curb on a mountain bike that I found at a shop. So 
I thought my I thought my day was done. I found uh, you know I was looking around. I saw um, God bless John Bulgens for for putting out those the big like twenty six Haro Masters. I saw that and I was like, oh dude, my freestyle bike when I was a kid. Problem was they were all sold out at Christmas, and I found a big ripper. Um, and and who didn't want a PK when they were a kid, right? This is like every kid's story. Um, here I am, a grown ass man. And I'm like, babe, for Christmas I want a PK Ripper. She's like, a what? I was like, just trust me, it's it's a bike I wanted when I was a kid. And she's like, yeah, sure, that's that's going to be like, how much is our insurance deductible? Was the first thing she asked. Like, how much have <laughs> we paid on the insurance before you can get a BMX bike? Um, but that that kicked us off into like this big BMX world that we're in now. Um, what do you, have, you know, like? What do you think of like these big BMX bikes that are coming back? I know like, you know. Skyway's making one. I know there's there's a like people are redoing some Hutch big bikes. What what's your take on these big bikes and and the movement that you're seeing now? Sure, let me give you my take. It's fantastic. It's I said I love getting kids on bikes. Hey brother, we're just kids. Well, you you get me on a bike and I'm a kid. I am a kid. And if there's if there's a curb, I'm jumping it. If there's if there's a can, I'm kicking out at it. Uh, we're kids on bikes and if that's and i get to see i get to did i mention i get to ride on fridays with pk river dude that that wouldn't be happening without bikes i love it i i love i love the whole big bike scene i love the fact that it's getting kids whether we're 60 50 40 30 years old and riding with our kids and in some cases with our grandkids that is awesome if if you get more people on bikes you keep any law bikes, you keep cars off the road, dude, I love you. I love you. You're, then you're my family. Then you're my family. Yeah, that's what Isaac and I say. I mean, it's, and you're totally right. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It, it, you know, the saying bikes bring, bring bonds, but it really does because not only do you have this family out there that's on bikes, uh, your brothers, your sisters, you know, on two wheels, and some you don't even know about because you haven't met them yet. But the fact that if you ride a bike and we connect just by the simple fact that you're on a bike too, it's amazing. What I mean, you try to think of other things, you know, it's like, okay, any sport you could choose. And yeah, there may be, you know, that as a part of it. But bikes really bring that full circle around, you know, and, and Isaac's mentioned it. You know, if I see you with a shirt on or if I see you with a sticker on your car, I already know you and I could actually pull over and talk and we could go for days and talk about what we're doing here, bikes, experiences, nostalgia. Um, and then riding with, you mentioned it, uh, Mike, riding with your family, your, your, your kids, your loved ones, your grandkids, or, or fill in the, the blank there. It can, it, we've been doing it and you've been doing it over 35, 40 years or, and some more, you know, I got a guy I ride with who's, you know, late sixties. Um, it's just the passion and it's having fun doing it and passing it on so others can enjoy it too, man. And it is so cool. I'll even ride it with people I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> it's just right. And listen, and, and if I see, if I see three guys on a bike, one guy is on a $18,000 electric Colnago and the other guy's on a $10,000, you know, pivot shuttle electric mountain bike. And the guy's on a big ripper, you know, which guy I'm going to talk to. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in why you're riding brother. Tell me, tell me about your good times. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. Yeah. I, I love it. So you're still, you tell me about like, what's your day to day now? You're, you're still working in the bike industry. What is, what's your, what's a day like Hollywood? Okay. First of all, does everyone call you Hollywood Mike Miranda at work? Please tell me they do. Uh, no, just Hollywood. <laughs> it's Mr. Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. It's just Hollywood. Yeah. It's just Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I get these Zoom calls, when I get these Zoom calls, my logo is me on a pink hutch doing a cross up. You know, that's, that's my, that's my image. That's it. You know, that's, that's who I am. And everyone knows me about most, you know, a lot of people in the company call me Hollywood. The people that know me certainly call me Hollywood. If you go down in, in the, in the little beach town, I, I, you know, we live in, if you ride down main, if I coast down main street, people come out and they don't yell, Hey Mike, it's, Hollywood. That's just, it's stuck. Yeah. It's stuck. What, it what was, is your, it was, it, it wasn't a compliment when I got it, but it's stuck. Okay. There's, there's a lot of urban legend about how you, how you got the name Hollywood. Um, there, there's urban legend about 
uh, you know, it was written on the top of your visor. It was written that there was like, you know, you just like to like, was it Bob Osborne just said, hey, he likes to show off. What's what's the true story of where this nickname came from? Oh, it came from, I'll give you the condensed version. Uh, it came from the rule at the track was that you had to have long sleeves to be able to ride, to be able to race. Well, one of the first times my dad took me to the track, I forgot my jersey. And so we rummaged around in the car and the only thing that we could find my dad had in the car was this long sleeve, wild print Hawaiian shirt with the big giant lapels I hear <laughs> that he used to check the dipstick. It was covered with streaks of oil, but it was only a long sleeve. And so I wanted to race. I didn't care, I put it on. I raced in that ugly thing. I looked like greasy Don Ho. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and as I was coming down the track, you know, coming in the race in last place, uh, the, the announcer was saying, and in last place, Mike Miranda. And my friend, Steve Guyberson, was in, sitting in the shade of the tower and, and he said, oh, check out Hollywood. And it was not meant as a compliment. And the announcer, Craig Kundig, who went on to run RRS Racing, right? He said the next moto and in last place, it's Hollywood Mike Miranda. And it stuck. From that point on, the next time I went, in, next time I went into the bike shop, hey, what's up, Hollywood? <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky it wasn't Greasy Don Ho. <laughs> <laughs> that could have been your moniker. <laughs> That's hard career. to fit on the back of a jersey, isn't it? Doesn't it fit on the back of JT pants, Greasy Don Ho. The slickest racer in BMX, Greasy Don Ho. <laughs> Tiny bubbles. Greasy bubbles. <laughs> oh man. That's great. So, so good. So what like so now what do you you do? What do you do in the bike industry though? I, I cut you off before you could tell me like what what do you what's your day to day? Do you do you like you plot out like co the company do you are you designing bikes what do you what i mean what does it look like because you're you have the end game to like what so many of us always dreamt about you know oh you're still in bikes what what is what does that look like to you well, know to 40 year old 47 year old me wants to know like what would have happened if i would have stayed in it and made all the right moves well if you had if you had the dad i had that taught you to work hard and the harder you work the luckier you get and uh, so I, I, I got a job in the industry and just kept working at it and have a, have a personality, enjoy talking to people. I believe in bicycles and I love bicycles. And now I am the director of business development and technical sales for Pacific Cycle, which is one of the largest bicycle, it's one of the largest bicycle companies in the world. When you, in the, in the umbrella of companies that we have, we are the largest bicycle company because we have Cannondale, GT, Mongoose, Schwinn, and several other brands that you may not have heard of. But it's a, it's a phenomenal co company to work for. I've been with them for a long time. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just lucky. I'm lucky. It's been a great life. It's been fantastic to be around bikes and bike people. And when I do presentations to large companies about, let's say it's Walmart, I do presentations. I start with, and, and, and by the way, the people at Wal the head guys at Walmart, you know what they call me. Hey, what's up, Hollywood? They all know me as Hollywood. When I start presentations, I start with, I'm a bike guy. And they get it. I'm a bike guy. I love it. I love being a bike guy. And for all those, those folks in your business uh, world that are in the meetings and stuff, I'm just going to uh, give them a little tip, uh, pro tip right now. Uh, one, never let Hollywood pour uh, water into your cup. And two, if he ever says, hold on guys, I'm going to tie my shoe. Just keep your eyes open because you don't oh. know what's coming next. I, yep. I, I will still, <laughs> I still sneak stuff into other people's luggage. We, that's a, we could do a whole nother show on that. Oh. This is incredible, man. I think one of my favorite ones was, uh, not long ago, about a year ago, I, uh, 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 Travis Pastrana, you may know who he is. He was, he, we were a, at an event together and he was flying home. Was, he was flying to Australia 
and his bike was going home. So I said, oh, yeah, hey, uh, let, me, let me box it for you. <laughs> oh, Sucker. <no. laughs> Poor Travis. What, so what did you do? I took a Sharpie, and before I put anything in this box, I wrote a, note, a big note on the inside of the box that said, hi, my name is Billy. I'm eight years old. This man keeps me in this box, and he makes <laughs> me – and he tickles me in my special place. Oh, no. <laughs> knowing that the only person, the next person that was going to see it worked for TSA. <laughs> we, we're going to come back. We're going to at Christmas time. We're coming back and we're going to do like Mike Miranda's top 10 pranks of all oh. time that you got to pick. I need you to just think about your top 10 favorite pranks because I've only heard of like three of them from other people. And so I want to hear what you think are your top, pranks oh man the best pranks the best pranks of all are the ones that you do that you that you orchestrate and then you're gone you're not even part of it but you know it gets them those are the best or they get blamed on somebody else oh, oh i love those save them and we'll, we'll do a follow-up episode of like mike miranda's <laughs> how to prank your pals with mike miranda that'll be another hijinks with mike miranda oh. featuring <laughs> It's just a, yeah. it's a day in my life, man. It's just a day in my life. It still happens. My my poor kids, they get it all the time. They get it all the time. Man, Mike, that is, you have the best stories, the best pranks, the best outlook on BMX. Uh, I mean, the, the the fact that you've lived your whole life doing this, um, from racing to managing brands, and that you still get to wake up and and basically BMX and ride a bike. Um, I say BMX because to me, BMX doesn't matter the size of your bike. It's just that you're out there doing some, some rad stuff on a bike. You're not just riding down the street. And if you just ride down the street and you're riding it on a BMX, I still love the shit out of you. I think you're great. So thanks for everything that you've done. Um, you know, I, Craig, what, what, what is your, what is it like, do you have any last questions that you have for, for Hollywood? I don't know if I have a last question, but I'm going to say, Mike, thank you so much for being on the show, man. Um, everything that you've brought to the table tonight, I was either laughing or reminiscing and the nostalgia, just some of the things put the hairs on my arm and neck. It's up been fun, it like, dude. It's been like it's one been of the funnest so interviews much we've fun. ever done. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, that feeling that you were talking about, like getting kids on bikes, putting that feeling of of freedom of jumping the ramp with your, your bed sheet or tied around your neck, those feelings, I wish everybody could experience. And as a matter of fact, Mike, don't you have something that you want to maybe announce to us right now about giving those feelings to someone? Dude, who there? doesn't want, who doesn't love a new bike? Let's right. give away a bike. Let's give away a bike to somebody tonight. Oh, You're dude. kidding. You're kidding. No. No, let's give away a GT Dino Heritage bike. Let's what? do it. What? All we need is we need somebody to to participate in what we're doing right now. You got to be part of this yes. family, and you got to be part of this family tonight. Oh yeah, dude. So so what? So let us know how that's going to go down. What? what I mean, if, this is incredible, guys. Check this what, out. What if? What if? You have to, we want you to subscribe. We want you to subscribe. I want you to be part of the same family I am tonight. So you, I would like you to subscribe. And then I want you to make a comment. I don't care what it is. You could talk about Buff's bearded girlfriend for all I care, but you got to <laughs> make a comment. And then before, right before the, the live chat ends, I'm going to pick a number. I'm not telling you if it's a high number or a low number, but I'm going to pick a number. And whoever's number that chat is, if you are the 350th chatter, commenter, you're going to get a new bike. I'm good. When they come in stock, Dude. I'm going to send you a new bike. That's incredible. So right that now, so crazy. So right now we're recording this, but we're going to, this is going to happen in the, in, in the future. So right now, while I'm talking, People are chatting with us live. What? Okay. So we're live chatting. You see that live chat on your phone, whatever. Make sure you go over to the main part of this episode and leave a comment there. 
because the live chat's just going to keep scrolling. But the comment, just leave one comment in the main section of this episode that you premiere that you're watching the premiere on. I'm gonna, I'll, you'll see a comment for me that says, leave a comment below. And that's where you know, man, just leave a comment. And then Mike, in the live chat, when this episode airs, you're gonna come to live chat, you are gonna say a random number. And then we're gonna scroll down through those comments and find that number next to that person's name and that person's gonna win. Is that, is that the way you wanna do this? Is that, does that sound good? That's awesome, that's awesome. What, Dude, what Mike. an incredible night, what an incredible night. That's no, that great. is incredible. First of all, thank you, that, that, the Stoke level through the roof, man. Thank that offer right there. You guys, do you understand that Hollywood Mike Miranda is offering to give away a GT Dino Heritage bike here on the Big Bike BMX show to one of you lucky listeners out there just for showing up and leaving some comments on our, uh, uh, in our comment uh, for the episode. Everybody's a winner on that one, man. You got to get in, leave a comment. Again, Mike, thank you so much for showing up, man. Isaac and I are super stoked to have you here. I just got to say it was a great time. I said it a couple other times about how cool it is to have you here. Isaac, uh, I just want to say thank you for being here too, man. Listen, everybody, as Mike said, as Isaac says, as we always say at the end of this show, thank you for listening. We appreciate all of you more than you will ever know. We love each and every one of you. We would love your support back. Go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button uh, on the show. And don't miss an, any rad episodes uh, coming up in the future or uh, anything that we have going on. You'll get a notification of when things are really happening around here at Big Bike BMX. Thanks again. Uh, we also are streaming on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So if you're on the go at work, riding your bike, getting rad out there and you got your earplugs in, you can hear our podcast at that time so thank you again everyone isaac let's take this out you guys again just what i'm echoing what craig said i appreciate every single one of you that tunes in that watches that leaves a comment you know what we're all in this together man welcome back to bmx go ride your bike do some crazy cross up like mike miranda um just make sure your insurance deductible if you're old like me make sure your insurance deductible is good enough to to handle the landing but uh you know we love you mike Thank you again from the bottom of my heart, man. You are a childhood hero. And, uh, man, you're everything that I, I hoped you would be, brother. Like, you are the happiest BMXer I have ever met. And, and I appreciate the shit out of you, man. Thanks for being here. Thank you guys for what you do. Thanks for spreading the love. And, man, thanks for keeping BMX alive, baby. Love it. Thank you guys. Awesome. Brothers. All right, everybody. Take care, be safe out there, and we'll talk to you next week. This is Isaac from Big Bike BMX. And this is Craig saying thank you, and we're out. Ba -ba